Hello everyone and thanks for coming to, to this Severo show, our colloquium. And it's a, it's a very special one, I think. I'll, I'll be very brief in the introduction. I think very, very deserves a better biographer than, than I can be. I want to say two words um, about the person we have with us today. Uh, one, one word is, is leadership. I think that is the key word describing his career. Um, it is very hard to run a large collaboration of scientists. It has been compared to, to herding cats, but it's probably more difficult than that. Because scientists don't always want to go in the same direction, and it needs a strong person that convinces all of these people to walk in one direction and get a project realized. But in his career, it's even harder than that, I think, because many of the projects he has led were in the phase where we don't yet have this multi-billion dollar machine. It's still a great idea. Some people are convinced it is a great idea. Some others are not, especially the people who have to pay for it. it requires some convincing. That requires people like Barry Barry who can realize these projects, make them real, and then we can have the science and the prizes. Of course, you know that he has all the relevant prizes. The biggest prize is, of course, the Princesa de Asturias, but he also has some other prizes. <laughs> <laughs> the second word I want to say is, is thank you. Thank you, of course, to the Severo Ochoa uh, excellent grant that made this, this series of Colloquia possible. To the people who've helped organize this, Isidoro, Alberto, uh, Mario and Carman. To Juan Fuster, who's made the contact. But the biggest thank you, of course, goes to the speaker today. He is very busy. We've seen the schedule for his Spanish tour, and he's probably not the only country he's visited since uh, he's been awarded the prizes. Uh, it's a very busy schedule. I'm very happy that we have been allocated a little slot in that, that very busy schedule, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, this account of gravitational waves, how we got to this point, and where we can go from here with a new, uh, a new discipline in science. We can really explore things in a way we could never do this, thanks to people like Barry Barry. Thank you very much for coming, and the floor is yours. Well, I'm, I'm actually happy to be here. I've been here several times, always very short trips, and mostly to do with the International Linear Collider, which I worked on for quite a few years um, with Juan. Uh, can I turn off the bright light on here or not? It's shining on them. Just the bright light on the screen. A a anyway, I, I gave a talk here last night to the public. Uh, I'm aiming this one differently than that, although there's some overlap for those that have been there. La last night I took a kind of historical approach to uh, the, the subject. Uh, this first slide is to illustrate that I'm trying to take a more forward-looking approach today. Uh, the, this picture is, of course, a picture of the globe, and the different bands on it are the different detections of black holes that we have made, the big bands or the black holes that we've made in LIGO since September 14th, 2015, when we made the first one, which is near the top. And, uh, and I'm sorry, near the bottom. And uh, what you should notice in this slide, in the sense that I'm saying it's forward looking, is that there's two of these that are much smaller. People here know that because they're involved in the reason why. But let me tell you, and I'm using this kind of symbolically, and that is, I want you to come away from this talk realizing not what we've accomplished, which is pretty fantastic even in my mind, uh, but that the future and the evolution is worth watching. It's going to be really uh, a, a wonderful field, I think, to pursue in the future. So this slide, the reason I say it's forward-looking is that we have these two little uh, points that are much smaller. They represent the fact that the Virgo detector in uh, Italy, near Pisa, has, it came online um, less than a year ago, last August. 
Uh, we were just finishing a long data run where several of these bands came for LIGO. And at that time, we were going to turn off actually at the end of July. Uh, eventually, we compromised to stay on for one additional month. We had been running a long time, and we wanted to improve the detector and turn off. We stayed on for one month. And staying on for one month, the uh, first thing that happened only two weeks into it is this little one in the bottom corner. And that was a black hole event determined where it is much better. You might say, so who cares where it came from? This tells us we know where it came from, from for something like 20 square degrees instead of 600 or 1,000 square degrees. The reason is that it gives us the ability to look with every astronomical instrument that can point to that part of the sky to see if there's any correlated signals from any astronomical instrument. We don't expect that for black holes. And in fact, that particular event, we didn't see anything. So that was as expected, but we were better. So we've improved our apparatus better. Not long after, just a few days later, we saw this event, which is up in the upper right-hand corner. I'll talk about it just a little bit in the seminar. And it represents the first case of us seeing a different kind of interaction. So we were lucky. It was neutron star uh, binary in spirals. You can't tell that from this picture, but I'll show you how. And from that, that now is a collision of nuclear matter rather than black holes. And so one expects to see all the nuclear interactions and, and uh, signals that one can see with various telescopes. And that became uh, a, a big deal last fall. And to me, it represents the fact that we're moving forward rapidly into uh, this field. And I'll talk about some of the other signals that I think we should be able to detect in the coming few years. Uh, and I'm going to try to give you a glimpse of where this probably will be able to go in the longer term. So let's begin. Uh, first, uh, gravitational wave, this is a more or less a picture of a binary system going around each other, emitting gravitational radiation. It's a necessary consequence of special relativity. Uh, the, the, Gravitational waves themselves come from the fact that we accelerate the masses as they go around. They're going around in a circle, trapped like the moon around the, the Earth. And as due to the accelerations, they basically radiate away. Radiation, which is shown here, which I'll spend the lecture talking about, which travels at the same speed as light. That is the speed as well, at least theoretically. And we know pretty well now that it's close to that which I'll mention later. So basically, that's the picture of what happens. I'll show you in one slide, more or less, in a simplified way, uh, why we expect gravitational waves if we formulate general relativity, from general relativity. So what I've done here is use general relativity. Some of you know general relativity. Some of you don't. Uh, but uh, I've defined how I did it here. I've done it in a way that's simple in the weak field limit where we're doing our uh, experiments in the strong field limit. I've done it purposely with picking uh, the conditions on the equation so that I get the equation in the right hand side. The equation on the right side looks should look familiar to physics physicists and that is it's basically the wave equation. The only thing that's new is the little letter is h mu nu. It's from, it's the quantity in general relativity called the strain. So if you don't know anything more about general relativity than what I've just told you, it's okay for the rest of the talk. But <coughs> realize that, that basically the wave equation, as we're used to it in electromagnetism, comes out of it with the relevant term being this strain. Uh, the uh, wave equation of course, then takes the form, just like electromagnetism, of a plane wave. So we have a plane wave, uh, just like electromagnetism, and it travels at the speed of light. So that much is the same. Uh, gravity is spin two, not spin one, like electromagnetism. And that has a consequence in this plane wave traveling. That is that they'll travel, I'm sorry, they'll travel, as you notice in the picture just above, that they travel with two components, just like we have two components in electricity and magnetism, 
but the two components are at 45 degrees from each other rather than 90 degrees from each other like electromagnetism. So that's what we expect. Again, uh, technically, although I'm not going to show that just because we're not very far along and haven't shown very much, but having three detectors, which we have now with the Virgo and LIGO detectors, we can disentangle the, in principle, the two components just like you would in electromagnetic waves. So we haven't done that yet. We look just barely at the first event that has uh, the three detectors. But a curiosity, maybe, is the fact that the experiment I'm talking about, kind of like the Hertz experiment that saw uh, electromagnetic waves, is a classical physics experiment. We're not doing a quantum physics experiment. Yet, we're completely capable of proving that gravity is spin two by, by uh, resolving, which we haven't done yet, the two components of gravitational uh, radiation. So that's background for gravitational waves themselves. Uh, there's a, a lot of target, uh, let me just say another thing about radiation before I say that. I made the analogy to electromagnetic radiation, but we know that electromagnetic radiation is uh, propagated and connected to photons. In this case, we don't, this is a classical phenomenon, and so the waves, although I made the analogy to electromagnetism, are not waves propagated by, in Einstein's theory at least, by something physical, like a equivalent of a photon or graviton, but are basically distortions or ripples in space and time itself that uh, uh, don't have carried with them, in the classical case, uh, any sort of quantum number. So even though I talked about spin one, spin two, it's, it's a classical way, much more like throwing a, a stone into a pond and stone sinks to the bottom, but the ripples are part of water itself that propagate its waves uh, outward. So basically it's a classical wave, a distortion of space and time itself, and what we'll do as experimentalists is measure that distortion of space and time. As we conceived of an experiment or a, a facility to measure this, there's a whole variety of signals that you might look at, and I give a few of them here that are target ones that we uh, basically are looking for even now. The first one is a binary, the inspire binary in spirals. And that's what we've discovered, that's what you've read about, that's what I'll talk about for most of this talk. Uh, the case that we thought we would see first was actually the binary in spiral of objects that have been seen in our own galaxy, that's neutron stars and neutron star pairs that eventually uh, come together and, and radiate. So we thought we'd see neutron star, star pairs uh, we know how to calculate the waveform for those, at least to make the detections. The detailed nuclear physics that comes comes later in the uh, waveform, and it's of great interest to us now. Uh, instead, the first detections we made were black hole, black hole uh, mergers. And uh, I'll talk mostly about that. That wasn't what we expected, because the prejudice was that there weren't black holes as heavy as we've detected from astrophysics. The converse of that is that we've already seen something in astrophysics that's different than what astrophysicists expected and therefore have to explain it. So we never knew the rate for the black hole ones and they have a special difficulty because of the, them being black holes to calculate what the waveforms that I'm showing on the right look like involve strong field gravity and are difficult to calculate on a computer. And the way we look for our signals, which I'll show you, requires us to do many, many calculations of these waveforms on computers. Uh, we fortunately were slow enough in building LIGO, taking us 20 years before we got enough sensitive sensitivity, that in the interim, we developed the ability to do these uh, waveforms on a computer. The technique that's used uh, is called match templates. So the idea, I'll show this briefly, but I'm going to give you the preview. The idea is that you have a signal that's always there looking at whatever light comes into our sensor and an interferometer. 
uh, going up and down. And we want to be able to see signals that don't necessarily st stick up over that background because they have a pattern that you can see uh, in the background itself. And we do that by doing what's called a match template. We calculate all the possible forms of different masses for the, uh, for the merger. We multiply that by the uh, signal and let it build up, a, by the noise, and let it build up a signal. And, I, and I'll show you that briefly. The very first event that we saw that was the discovery of gravitational waves was so big that it didn't even need this uh, uh, mechanism. Second possible source, and we haven't seen that yet, uh, is, but as I said, I want to be more forward-looking today than I was last night, is a burst signal from supernova. No. Actually, when I made this slide, we didn't know about gamma ray bursts, whether they were from neutron star mergers for sure. So I listed it here also because it's a burst-like signal, at least optically. And uh, uh, that turns out to be connected to the neutron star in spiral that we saw. But the class of events and the way we search is instead of some known template of uh, evolving in spiral, in this case we look for a burst signal that comes from, for example, the collapse of the star. Or, or something else that would uh, give a burst signal. Uh, the third one that I mentioned here, uh, by the way, the third one that I mentioned here, I'll, I'll make a comment later, is a class of signals that are maybe periodic. And that would come from the fact that we know in our own galaxy that there's lots of pulsars, uh, which we see the electromagnetic signal at different frequencies. Uh, and uh, to the extent that they are not perfectly spherically symmetrical, they have a quadruple moment, and that would give gravitational wave signals. So we look for those. It's a very difficult problem, because if we look for them from all the known pulsars, we tend to look at the most spherically symmetric uh, pulsars that exist, because they've been around long enough to have a very steady signal in the electromagnetics re regime, and therefore they're not giving as big of a, of a signal for gravitational waves. The ones that are early after a collapse of a star, for example, uh, would give the biggest signal. So the problem that we have, which I don't have time to go through in detail today, is that we look for all the known ones. So far we haven't seen any. Uh, I can't show you the evidence today, but basically we've proven that the most well-known pulsars don't have mountains on them, basically they're bigger than a millimeter. Uh, if you transfer it to size. Uh, but uh, searching for the more likely ones to give a gravitational wave signal requires looking for ones that haven't been seen in radio telescopes, and that's a very difficult problem because we have to look at different lengths everywhere in the, in the universe, uh, different ephemeris and so forth. And that's a computing problem that's well beyond our ability to do the computing. So what we've done is make something we call Einstein at home, which I won't talk about, but you can find it on your laptop. And we, we basically copy the idea from SETI at home, which is looking for extraterrestrial life. And we basically use uh, background cycles from your laptop to help us uh, scan the sky. So anyone who feels they have background cycles that you want to lend us, look up Einstein at home. Uh, lastly, and probably in the long, long term, the most interesting is to see cosmological signals. That is, signals from the very early universe. And uh, the reason that's potentially so interesting is that photons, which is the source of measuring all the information we have on the early universe primarily, which comes from the cosmic microwave background, <coughs> is absorbed. Uh, at about 400,000, anything before 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So if you want to get back to the first instance of the Big Bang, you need a different, you need to do something other than photons. Uh, there's two possibilities, neutrinos or gravitational waves. Neutrinos would be possible in principle, but the difficulty is that neutrinos that came from the early universe have thermalized and they're so low in energy at this point that uh, the cross-section is so small, it's, it's, there's no conceivable way that we know that we can detect neutrinos 
from the early universe. So the remaining possibility is gravitational waves. We can't do that now. Uh, of course, it took hundreds of years of astronomy before we've developed the ability to do it with photons. Um, but eventually, we have to know more about all the backgrounds and so forth and know what frequency band to look in. But I think the ultimate experiment with gravitational waves, other than finding something that's completely new somewhere, is to measure the cosmological signal. And someday, I, I believe that'll, that'll be done, but not in the next couple decades. Uh, lastly, and not listed here, and we spend a lot of time on that, and I'm not going to talk about it uh, in any detail, is we have, in gravitational waves, we're looking at the universe for hopefully for uh, effects, phenomena that don't emit electromagnetic radiation. They're new, and so they're not on this graph. So how do we look for those? Um, we actually have a whole group in LIGO that looks for what we call unmodeled signals. Of course, we haven't seen any or you've heard about it, you've heard about it. Uh, and the way we look is we have a uh, we're not very good at it. We're still looking for good ideas. How do you look for what you don't know, what you're going to find? Uh, the way we look so far is by developing basically the equivalent of waveforms, like we look here, and look in the data for waveforms, and try to make those waveforms have no physics prejudices in them. As a physicist using some phenomenology, we, we've developed basically a, a a few algorithms, but they're based on wavelets, which don't, which is a form to make kind of random waveforms, but not starting from some physics <coughs> principles. So we use that. We're starting to use uh, the possibility, a different approach, which is to go through all this data and use machine learning to find ways to find maybe signals that we weren't looking for that stand out. So, and that is just a learning game right now. So we're just uh, figuring out how to do it. So all this is kind of the broad program that we're doing. I'll concentrate on the signal that we have detected. So the effect is really small, and it is what basically determines everything about what you have to do experimentally. I put in the numbers over here for the first event that we discovered. Uh, the masses of the two black holes that are shown here are about 30 solar masses. The distance that they're apart at the time we detect them, they're of course going on for millions of years before that. We only see the very last instance when the frequency gets high enough to get into our detector, which I'll describe, which is the audio band, so higher than 10 hertz. The frequency going around each other is lower than that for most of the life of this binary system, but we detect the very last part. The one that we detected, which I'll show you, it was uh, about eight cycles in the last two-tenths of a second in the merger. Uh, the distance they were apart at the time we could see them was about 100 kilometers. And they were going around each other by the time they merged at about, at about 100 times a second. Uh, we tell from the amplitude of the signal directly how far away the uh, the signal was, and in this case, that first signal was 500 megaparsecs away, the black hole signal. So putting that all in, uh, the formula that comes out of uh, relativity, uh, we get this little h that I used at the beginning comes out a number of 10 to the minus 21. And that directly translates to the experimental uh, variable that you want to measure. It's basically that little age, and it's a change of length over length. What it is physically is fractionally how much space has been distorted. So it's more complicated because we distort both space and time at the same time, but this is a good a way to look at the problem in terms of how well we have to do things experimentally. So we have to measure uh, little age of 10 to the minus 21. And we expect a signal that looks something like this. The very first part, which it says merger here, which could have as many as a thousand cycles. When I show you the first event, we only detected six or eight, I think eight cycles. And could go along as long as a minute in our device. That's getting to be the um, 
place where the black holes, I mean, where the mergers are light objects. The heavy objects uh, don't go to as high a frequency. And the first ones we detected only went up to about 100 hertz and about eight cycles that we saw. The second phase, just to say the whole thing, is the merger itself, the coalescence or the merger itself. <coughs> In the long run, that's the really interesting part because it's where we can't calculate it. And it's where we basically have strong field gravity. So to really test Einstein's theory of gravity, or alternatives to Einstein's theory of gravity, the way we want to test it isn't in the weak field limit, but in the strong field limit. And this potentially is our laboratory for studying uh, strong field effects. And lastly, there's the phenomenon of it ringing down, and we can predict what the frequency is of that ring down. On our first events, which I won't go through in detail again, we can compare the general relativistic calculation from these first uh, uh, cycles coming together and merging independently with the ring down frequency and the amplitude of the merged signal, and we get a consistent answer. I, I'm not sure if I put that in these slides, I think not. And that's a test of general relativity itself, and we've <coughs> tested general relativity in a variety of ways that we know how. I'll show you just a little bit of that. The right-hand side is just to indicate what I said in words, and that is a, a lighter, a merger of lighter compact objects will have more cycles in our apparatus. Not more cycles itself, but more cycles above 10 hertz, which is our lowest frequency we can detect. Okay, so gravitational waves, uh, when they come to a detector, now I'm going to talk about detecting them. Uh, we wanted to detect an effect that's something like 10 to the minus 21. And the effect is to distort, say, a circle of free masses. So imagine a circle of free masses and then a gravitational wave coming through it. It makes it uh, distorted, makes it more elliptical, and somewhat taller by a distance that's this delta L. And it'll do that, and with a frequency, whatever frequency it's at, It'll go back and forth between making it taller and thinner, as I've indicated here, and shorter and fatter. Taller and thinner, shorter and fatter. That turns out to be a perfect match to interferometry. And so interferometry, after people tried to detect gravitational waves by another technique using the distortions of the big aluminum bar, uh, which only in its final states was maybe six orders of magnitude less sensitive than ours. Interferometry is an ideal way to try to detect this distortion. Interferometry is used in many, many things in physics and engineering. Uh, in our case, it's actually a, a very nice choice for this problem where I'm trying to measure the difference between two distances that are going to be really tiny. We're going to have this 10 to the minus 21 number. Uh, in nature, it's very, in physics, or it's very difficult to measure absolute, the absolute standards, and that's why we have, you know, Bureau of Standards, and they measure the length of a meter stick or a weight of a kilogram and so forth. Uh, it's much easier, and you can do much more precisely when you're trying to measure the difference between something that's supposed to be almost identical. And that's what we have here. And we happen to have the fact that it, uh, is geometrically a very good match to interferometry. So what's shown in this picture going at a couple times a second is what a gravitational wave exaggerated would do to the length of the two arms as it went through the detector. The laser beam comes in from the left. You uh, split the beam, half of it going to the right, half of it going up. To the extent that no gravitational wave comes through, it'll come back at exactly the same time. You invert the signal of one compared to the other. They cancel each other. And the, uh, the sensor, shown in the bottom, sees nothing. And that's what happens for almost all the time, except for noise signals that we get that make it not exactly totally black. Uh, when it changes, like this would be a gravitational wave at a couple times a second, then the light going down one arm when the light is split, goes going down one arm and coming back from the other arm won't come back at exactly the same time, and they cancel each other. 
and uh, what they don't quite cancel each other, and we measure that uh, uh, difference. So that's the uh, effect of gravitational waves. To do this measurement, there's a lot of details, and especially in the interferometry that I can neglect, that is innovations that were developed over decades to do interferometry more precisely than ever, has ever been done before. How precisely we have to do it, I indicate here, because I'm indicating the two challenges you have to do this experiment. We have to do interferometry where if you've done interferometry in a freshman or sophomore physics lab, you see these fringes where we split the fringe to one part in 10 to the 12. Typically in a laboratory, we do it in one part in 10 to the 2 or something. Uh, fancy interferometry may be one part in a million. We have to do it in one part in 10 to the 12th. Uh, we do that by a whole host of innovations in interferometry which took years of development and are the heart of making LIGO or Virgo work the way, they, uh, with, the way they're capable of doing. This we achieved probably pretty much five years ago or more, so they weren't the final key to making the measurement, but we had to do this as the heart of making the fanciest and most precise interferometers ever made. The second problem is that we're working on the Earth's surface. And it turns out that on the Earth's surface, we have to work where the Earth is as quiet as possible. Our ears have figured that out. Uh, we, through evolution, developed our ears to hear where the Earth shakes the least. And that starts at about 10 hertz or so and goes up to thousands of hertz, which is the frequency band for audio. We're not doing anything audio. We change our signal to an audio signal because it looks nice for public relations, but we're not doing anything audio at all. However, we have the same laboratory, the Earth, as our ears had to make find a quiet place to do what we want to do. In the case of the ears, it's communicate with each other. In our case, we want to make sure the Earth isn't shaking too much and destroys the interferometry. That's the same band. So we work in the audio band uh, on LIGO, and we work to reduce the vibrations of the Earth by a factor of 10 to the 12. I'll show you how we do that, and it's the key to the final, uh, our ability to finally make the measurement. We built two LIGOs from the beginning, actually three. Uh, one in Livingston, Louisiana, one in Hanford, Washington. Uh, they're 3,000 kilometers apart, which means at the speed of light, any signal, whether it comes from the left, whether it comes from the right, whether it comes down, has to be within plus or minus 10 milliseconds of each other if gravi gravitational waves really travel at the speed of light. So a requirement we make when we look at the signals in the two interferometers, the one in uh, Hanford, Washington, the one in Livingston, is that the signals be within plus or minus 10 milliseconds of each other. We look at the bands where they're not in coincidence with each other, to do a detailed measurement of how often these instruments just give signals randomly that would be correlated, and that allows enables us to measure the probability that something we really see is real or could have been generated uh, randomly. So that's the uh, that's it. The beginning then of LIGO starts here. It's 1994, and this is the beginning of construction of LIGO itself. You see no LIGO, it's just uh, we've cleared the ground. Mm -hmm. This is in Livingston, Louisiana. It's a pine, uh, commercial pine forest. So that's uh, pine trees that are in the darker shade of green. Uh, we had to make a physics decision in 1994 when we made this picture. And that was interesting in the sense that if we build these two interferometers, do we build them so they're aligned with each other or at some angle from each other? Uh, and that was uh, hotly debated among us of what, what to do, whether to make them parallel or make them at an angle to each other. If we made them at an angle to each other, then by comparing the shape of the signal in Hanford and the shape of the signal in Livingston, we can do something I showed earlier, which is decompose the two components of gravitational waves, uh, which we want to be able to do, of course. Um, 
However, since we've never detected gravitational waves, uh, the signals may look quite different from each other because the two components are different from each other. If we line them the same as each other to within the 16 degree curvature of the Earth between Hanford and Livingston, then we expect the signals to look identical. And eventually we made the decision to do that so that we could make the most convincing detection and recognizing that another detector was being built in near Pisa, the Virgo detector, which would give us ultimately the ability in collaborating with them to uh, uh, resolve the, the uh, polarization. And in fact, the collaboration with Virgo started in 1997. So while we were still constructing, we invited someone from Virgo to spend a sabbatical at Caltech. And during that period, we agreed, and this is unique and say doesn't happen at CERN, uh, to use the same data format. And we invented a data format. The data itself is different, of course, but we invented a data format, which would be the same in each case, which would enable LIGO to be able to analyze Virgo data and vice versa. So that's 1994. It took us four or five years to build it, just a couple of pictures. We, made the big vacuum system out of three millimeter stainless steel, uh, which we made a, a spiral well. Uh, that this is a picture of the tube. It looks, should look rather big to you. It's 1.2 meters in diameter. So why with laser beams do we make such a big pipe? The reason we make such a big pipe is that we, for two reasons. One is our whole laboratory is effectively inside this uh, pipe. So there's no reason we can't run multiple interferometers inside. And in fact, we have room with the size interferometers we're building to have about a half a dozen interferometers if we chose to inside the same device. And you might have noticed I said two or three earlier that we had built. We originally built three interferometers. One of two of them in the same infrastructure, the same pipe at uh, Hanford, Washington. But one of them was half the length of the other. And that was because we didn't know what we had to deal with in terms of local backgrounds that might come from lightning or whatever that we didn't know. And if we make the interferometers, one interferometer inside the same instrument half the length of the other, a gravitational wave signal would be half the size. Uh, but a light signal from lightning would be the same size. So we could dif differentiate basically uh, unknown backgrounds which we didn't know we have. Turns out that's not necessary, uh, but by the time we built advanced LIGO, uh, we learned that we don't really need two interferometers inside the same one unless we want a specialty one, say one looking at, at a specialized frequency band. And instead, what we've done is take the third interferometer, which was funded and built anyway, and it's moving to become the third LIGO in India, which you might have heard of in the future. So we're gonna have a third interferometer in India uh, within the next roughly five years. Uh, the interferometers, this has been the picture of the two. They, we, keep, we work really hard to keep them absolutely identical. What I mean isn't identical for a picture like this, but every time we change anything, uh, software, hardware in the control system, anything changed at one side propagates immediately to the other side and we make the changes and make them identical to keep them identical. And when you see the performance, unless we do something that we haven't changed in one yet for, compared to the other one, they're identical. This is the inside of the business part of LIGO. Uh, I show this to give you just a sense that it's not just a little thing like you see in your lab. Uh, a person is about a third of the way up on this picture. Not as big as a CERN detector, but you notice all the ports and so forth inside each of these devices is our uh, suspension system to hold the mirrors, the uh, lasers, the, the uh, seismic isolation systems, and lots of test beams and so forth. So we have ports all over them, as you notice, and they were oversized. We did that purposely in the beginning, <clears throat> knowing that we wanted to evolve LIGO, which we have done, that's why it's called advanced LIGO, without having to rebuild the infrastructure. It's always much more expensive to build infrastructure than it is technical instruments. And so if we had a future vision of making a better version of LIGO, we tried to 
spend all the resources we needed to only once on the infrastructure, and that turned out to be successful. On the right and the left, you'll see the kind of big slab that sticks up. That's a gate valve, and it's a special gate valve for these big uh, tubes. And that gate valve keeps the long vacuum pipes under high vacuum uh, while we can work on the instruments inside the uh, interferometer itself, the mirrors, the uh, lasers, and so forth. So the large vacuum system was built, was brought down to high vacuum in the late 1990s, and it's never come up to air since that time. Okay, so what limits this device? Let me go through these, and then you'll see more or less what our challenge is, and I'll concentrate on the one that enabled the measurement. So first, uh, high vacuum. I just mentioned that. The problem is that if a la the laser beam hits any molecule on its way to the mirror on the far end that you're going to reflect against, it can find a path and hit those sidewalls. It can find a path that's longer than the straight line back and forth. It'll come back later and we'll see signals. So we have to be in high vacuum. You'll see in the graph that I show how high, but basically we decided to go all the way and make the best vacuum we could in this system from the beginning. The second thing is the laser. And the laser is very special. We have a laser that uh, works in the, uh, it's a neodymium YAG laser. Uh, and uh, we picked that from the beginning and have developed it to be, uh, it's, it's a single line laser at uh, 1060 nanometers. The uh, wavelength is in the infrared, so you can't see it. Uh, we make a coating on our mirrors that reflects at that wavelength, and uh, basically that's, the, that's it. We also work very hard to stabilize the laser. It has to be much more stable than the laser in this pointer. We stabilize it by locking it to cavities, and the wavelength and amplitude fluctuations, and pointing, for example. The third one, and it's the one to concentrate on the most when you leave the auditorium of how we managed to make the detections, is seismic noise. So I mentioned that already, that basically the shaking of the earth is, a, is our biggest problem. And we have to reduce the shaking of the earth by a factor of 10 to the 12th to make the measurement. And uh, I'll show you how we do that in just a minute. Uh, the next one is the fact that unfortunately we're not good enough yet to cool the apparatus to low temperatures, so we have mirrors that are at room temperature and uh, molecules move around at room temperature, so we have some thermal noise or Brownian motion that we have to worry about, and you'll see where that comes in in a minute. Uh, and lastly, we have kind of more interesting, it's called quantum noise in this field, and that is in order to make the measurement well, we want as many photons as we can have, so we have a very high power laser. We trap the light in what are called fabric pro resonant arms, bounce it 300 times, which is a magic number that works for this distance. And uh, uh, with all these photons, as we increase, they put pressure on the mirror and move it. So we have to worry about putting pressure on the mirror at the same time we're getting more and more photons, which you need to make the measurement, especially at high frequencies. So we call that quantum. What we end up with is a uh, sensitivity curve that looks like this. And this sensitivity curve, the shaded region, is the region of sensitivity. And you'll see it's bounded on the lowest air, low end by seismic. That's what it says. And so that's the limitation at the lowest frequencies. That was the limitation in making a measurement of the black holes, which are at our lowest frequencies, because they were so heavy. At the highest frequencies, we see we're limited by what's called shot noise, or for particle physicists, photostatistics. Uh, that's how many photons you have. And that's how fast you can sample. The ear is the same. We call our ears cut off because of the shaking of the earth at the low frequencies. If they could detect five hertz, we'd be pretty noisy. At the highest frequencies, our ears cut off because they can't sample fast enough. And here, we don't have enough photons as we go to higher and higher frequency. The middle one is what I call thermal, so that's the fact that we're working at room temperature. And below that, you can see that there's residual gas that's scattering off molecules, 
and uh, stray light and other things shown. Uh, so that as an experimentalist, we have kind of a nightmare in the sense that usually when you do a, uh, an experiment as an experimentalist, there's some terrible background that you deal with and you do all kinds of clever things to knock it down. In our case, we have three backgrounds that, that limit us, not one at a given time. Uh, and uh, if we go any further, we have new ones. So it's a really difficult challenge uh, experimentally. We can't beat these all at one time. So when we talk about the future, which is kind of the thrust I want to give to this talk, then uh, we always have a question. Do we really work on improving, for example, the seismic background? We're off now, improving the detector. Or, for example, the high frequency part. And you can argue both ways from even the science we've already seen. If we want more black holes, we want to improve the seismic and better, and we're not at our design limit. And if we want to see the nuclear physics to understand what neutron stars look like, what their equation of state is, for example, uh, that gives signals at high frequencies. So there we want to change the laser and so forth. So we have all kinds of internal battles and we can't do it all at once and it'll take a while before this all gets to where we are as good as we can be. So you have to be patient in the future, but we're getting there. This is the evolution of LIGO. So we built it in the 1990s in 2001. You'll notice the shape looks like the shape I showed you. The top one was the first time we decided to look for gravitational waves. You notice it's a log scale on the left. Um, and the, the little spikes that go up and down, those are like graphs. Those are mostly uh, known. Later they get to be like on the very bottom. You'll see they're not so frequent as at the very top. Uh, they're known places where there's resonances somehow in our detector. They can be electrical. In our case, 60 hertz, multiples of 60 hertz, or they can be mechanical. Any mechanical system that's holding something up has uh, resonances. So we know them. They're stable. They're at the same place. So we notch that out. It's about 1% of the, of the uh, area. So we, we notch that out. And it's always just a problem for visibility for talks like this. You'll notice that we then ran this in something like seven times, each time looking for gravitational waves each time failing to see gravitational waves, uh, and each time making it better the subsequent uh, run. So basically we'd run the apparatus maybe six months or nine months, different amount of time, spend another six months or nine months making changes, some of which came from what we learned by running it, some of which were just improved technologies that we developed as we went along that weren't working at the level that we had designed. Eventually, we get to the bottom, where it looks, except at the very lowest frequencies, looks like uh, a little line that's drawn through it, which you can kind of see go up. You'll see it better in a minute. And that was when we reached our design uh, sensitivity with the initial version of LIGO. At this point, if we want to make it better, we had to actually replace a lot of what was inside this infrastructure, which we were keeping. So this meant new and bigger and better test masses, a new laser, so forth and so on. A better suspension system and a better seismic isolation system. This is where we were then in about 2010, by about 2010. Uh, there's two colored graphs here. They have those uh, resonances that get notched out. The two colors just represent us doing a data run, one emphasizing high frequency by changing the optics somewhat, and one emphasizing the low frequency, and neither of them seeing gravitational waves. You'll notice the line that goes through is, except for the lowest frequencies, is as far as we could get. At that point, actually, we had developed the technologies by that point to make uh, a revision of LIGO itself, what we call advanced LIGO. We called it LIGO 2, but the National Science Foundation immediately said, if you're talking about LIGO 1, 2, you're assuming there's going to be 3, 4. <laughs> Please change the name, and it became Advanced LIGO, so that's the history. Uh, so I don't especially like the name, but that's how it happened. Uh, so we made a, a goal. One is to increase the sensitivity by at least a factor of 10 everywhere. At high frequency, it means a better laser. At middle frequencies, it means a better system of 
hang, how we hang, and what the test masses and optics look like. And at the lowest frequencies, better seismic isolation. We made a goal to improve at a factor of 10 to this little dotted line in the bottom. Now what you realize is that we measure an amplitude when we measure gravitational waves. And so if we improve the sensitivity, a factor of 10, we improve the distance we look out into the universe linearly, a factor of 10. It's not like something that falls off as the square of the distance. So that means if we increase the sensitivity a factor of a 10, we see 1,000 times more possible uh, sources of gravitational waves than we did in the initial detector. So this is a huge step. Technically, of course, a factor of 10 is always tough. If you worked very hard to make some device to make it a factor of 10 better, it's ambitious. Uh, but we knew how to do that. We had been de de developing the technology since we finished building the first instrument and had been developed them over 10 years. So this is what we we're going to do to improve it. We, uh, I won't go through all the improvements. This is just to show you there's a lot of them. I'm only going to talk about one. Uh, so we did. Every, we improved everything from the laser to the optics to the uh, uh, mirrors themselves. This is the final uh, laser that we have just to show you it's more complicated than the one in my hand. Uh, this, this, this is the, what the mirrors look like. Uh, these mirrors are incredibly beautiful. They're 40 kilo, uh, kilogram piece of glass, uh, few silica. You look at it and it's just the most beautiful piece of glass you ever looked at looking right through it. Uh, of course, that's not what the laser sees because the laser's in the infrared. The laser actually sees the coating that we have on the front, which is a coating that reflects uh, uh, you, uh, the ultraviolet light. So even though it looks clear to us, it doesn't to the laser. Uh, the mechanical requirements and so forth on this mirror are the highest in the world, more than our super mirrors that are used in, in uh, astronomy. And so we've had to do a, a lot of work in developing and doing air correction and making the mirrors good enough and then making coatings on it. We still are amateurs, and it's a place we can really improve ourselves. We don't have a coating that's really properly matched to the fused silica, uh, so the heating and so forth causes an interface between them, and it's one of our kind of limitations that we still have in LIGO, and that's when I say that LIGO can keep being made better because it's limited by ourselves, not having really the right mirrors and so forth, not by fundamental problems in nature. So LIGO will keep getting better, and Virgo. Okay, so when we first made LIGO, this is what the suspension system looked like. It was uh, a mirror hanging, it's a mirror and a test mass if you want for general relativity, hanging from wires. So why do we do that? If I have a pendulum and I have something on the bottom and I wiggle the top, it doesn't move very much, everybody knows that. So basically hanging it and suspending it is part of the way to really isolate it from the earth or movement itself. So we hang it from the earth. Initially, the wire we used to hang it was piano wire. That was a bad match to the problem. We have fused silica, so we learned how to make uh, fused silica wires for advanced LIGO. And what you'll notice on there is little instruments in front of the mirror. That's there to correct for the fact that Making this interferometer is a little complicated because we have hanging mirrors, and yet you want to keep them in one place. And so we have to figure if they move to correct them to keep them in the same place to keep it as an interferometer. That's done with little magnets and actuators. Unfortunately, that created noise in initial LIGO. So we rebuilt this whole system for advanced LIGO as a multiple pendulum. That is four, four parts of the pendulum where the bottom one is just itself, fused silica, so it's quiet, but we have to adjust and keep it stable by moving all the top ones. It's quite tricky, but that's what we learned to do over the 10 years. So we made a quadruple pendulum, but it's basically the idea of a pendulum, keeping the fused silica as quiet as possible by having no instrumentation here. Now, the time to wake up so you know what, uh, what we did to actually make the final detection. In order to, 
to, and the scheme is somewhat different in Virgo, but I'm not talking about Virgo today, so I'll tell you our story. Uh, the scheme we use <coughs> to isolate ourselves from the ground, other than the pendulum, which helps, at least for vertical motions, but it doesn't, uh, is basically to do the same thing you and your car, to use shock absorbers. So your car, you go over a bump, and it takes a high-frequency bump, transfers it to low frequency, and you feel a little smooth thing, and you're happy with the Mercedes or whatever you drive. Um, it has a good suspension system. We worked very hard to make the, the ideal uh, springs. So those are springs just in your car. So we made the same idea. We just made them just the right cushiness and so forth to be able to damp the motion as well as possible. And we made it four layers. So what wasn't damped by the first got damped by the second, third, and fourth. And that's all inside of these big chambers. So that's what we made. And that got us, it turns out, a factor of 10 to the 10th. You remember I said we need a factor of 10 to the 12th. So at the end of everything I've shown you so far, we got a factor. That's pretty impressive to me, the 10 to the 10th, but it wasn't good enough to detect black holes. What we did is, is add to it something we planned to do since uh, the 1990s, but didn't took us 10 more years to develop the detailed technology. The idea is simple. is to take the same idea that's used when you fly in an airplane and you put uh, earphones on uh, that cancel the noise of the engines. So what they're doing is the fact that the engines are making the same kind of noise it's taking that adiabatic noise and making a cancellation signal, and you don't hear the engines roar anymore. Uh, you still hear the stewardess talk to you because that's not an ambient background, and that works very well. We're not doing anything audio like that, but the idea is the same. So our idea then was to take the seismic system, add to it seismic sensors that can tell any residual motion, ambient motion that's coming, and the direction, which makes it a much harder problem than for, uh, uh, for the earphones, which don't care where the direction is coming from. So we tell the direction. We do it in six dimensions. We do it in the three linear dimensions and the rotations. So we have seismometers that tell us all of that. And then we push the other direction and cancel the motions. And that gave us the extra factor of 100. And you can see that here. When we uh, turned back on, we got a factor of 3. Like I said, that gave us a factor of 27, but at the low frequencies, we got a factor of 100. That meant we were 100 times, able to see 100 times further out, and that's 100 cubed, or a million times the rate that we had before. And so when people have asked us, how is it possible after 10 years of running, when you turn back on, you saw black holes after a few days, now you know why. We we're actually a million times more sensitive. Once we turned on, we then saw this signal, which people have seen. Uh, and now let me talk about the signal just a bit. Uh, the top graph is the signal, the signal itself, one uh, on the left in Washington, the one on the right in Louisiana. As I showed in the very, very first slide, they were almost identical. You can put one on top of the other. The second pane is the best fit we have using numerical relativity and calculating general relativity on the computer and fitting it to the data. It looks the same qualitatively. The third pane is important, again, for an experimentalist. And this is how you look to see that whether there's any residual effects. These are the residuals. That means subtracting the noise, the noisy signal from the calculations using general <coughs> relativity. And you don't see any patterns anywhere. It just goes up and down, which gives us confidence that the fit is working and we're not fooling ourselves. Uh, this is just a picture of how fast the background falls um, if we look to see coincidences. So the picture on the very far right, the little star, is the signal, the strength of the signal, is some statistic we use. The strength of the, uh, the signal uh, that we measured in this event that I just showed you. On the left is all the background signals that we got over time. And the black one that comes out includes this signal. If I just subtract that from the data, it's the blue that goes down. And you'll see this is a log scale. And using this, 
affect how much we see off time versus on time is how we're able to establish that the probability of this being accidentally generated is less than the magic five sigma that's used in physics and astronomy. And that's uh, shown at the very top by greater than 5.1 sigma. We don't see a background, we just could don't run longer to see that it's better than the five sigma. Physically, that signal transforms to this picture. And that is, initially, you have an in spiral of these two objects. They're getting closer together. They merge, just as I said. And then there's a little bit of ring down at the very end. And then the bottom is how far apart they are on the right-hand side in Schwarzschild uh, uh, radiuses, which is about 75 kilometers each. So they're 100 kilometers or so apart. And the velocity of the two objects, these compact objects, which are going at about half, you can see it from the left scale, at about half the speed of light when they, when they collide. Okay, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there's an incredible amount of information in the waveform. So we get this waveform that goes up and down, and we can use the formula that you get for this merger, the so-called short mass. I've just written the first term here, there's another term. And from that, we get all the information about the uh, parameters of the objects that are coming together. And it's a, a huge amount of information, limited only by the accuracy of the measurement, uh, which we do. The distance away that the event happens is the amplitude, or inversely proportional to the amplitude. And we measure, in principle, adding second terms and third terms, we can measure, uh, which we're not good enough yet to do, meaning the signal's not strong enough until we get a, make a more sensitive detector, we can measure, in principle, from this waveform, the spins of the two objects that are coming together. Now we measure the spin of the final object. Precession, and if there's any, we can already look to see if there's any evidence of precession. We don't see any, but we don't have any good uh, measurements of that. So we can measure the sky location, which I talked about at the beginning, the distance, all this kind of information, and that, eventually will be used to do a lot of the work on testing general relativity. Uh, the parameters for this first event, I just summarized here, they've been in the literature, there are about 30 solar masses each, a total of 62 solar masses for the final object, and it radiated away a couple solar masses of the energy being the brightest object in the sky and energy at that point in that two-tenths of a second that we observed. Uh, we measure, this so shows the spin, so our ability to measure the spin of the object and the mass of the objects coming together and so forth. So as I said, this all comes out of the, of the uh, calcula calculations of uh, fitting that waveform. This is the searching that I told you about, a match filter. So let me just emphasize, you have a noisy background like shown here and you want to pick out a signal that looks like the little sample one I have. It's not a merge signal. What happens is I multiply one times the other. That's what a match filter does. And this is showing what happens. So when you, nothing, it just goes up and down, does nothing. But if you get a match between what you put in and that, you get then a spike, which then we go back and look at. So that's the way we find, we search for events. The lower left picture is how densely we populate the space of masses of one object and the other to search for these objects, and the little circles and triangles are where we found events at the time this plot was made. The different colors are, in the top, the blue part is uh, black hole, black hole mergers, high masses for each. Uh, uh, black hole, neutron star, and neutron star, neutron star. So far we've seen one event of neutron star, neutron star, about a half a dozen black hole, black hole, and have yet to see a black hole neutron star, and it's not clear that we're efficient in looking for them because the calculation is very difficult when you have a heavy object and a light object. So we, in searching for them, it's more difficult when these objects get very different in mass. Okay, this is actually a picture of that match filter for the second event that we saw and how we picked out that signal, which was seen before we published the very first event on December of the same year, the Boxing Day, December 26, which for some of us gave us even more confident, confidence that what we'd seen was real. 
Uh, we take the shape, as I said, in detail. So one that has gone a long ways. This is the, from uh, the Fisher of Letter article on our second event. And break it up to look for the effects of, of uh, general relativity. We see no de deviations, no matter how we look at it at this point. And just pictorially, this is a picture of how these events cross our detector sensitivity. Because now you know what the sensitivity looks like. The top one, which only comes into our band and dies off a little over 100 uh, hertz, is the very first event that we saw, and the most strongest because it was very heavy masses and only 500 megaparsecs away. The second and third are just two of them. The one that I showed that's very long is the one that sticks out to high frequency. So that shows you all that. Uh, now let me uh, add the final detection. This is all now less than a year old. The Virgo detector, as I mentioned at the beginning, turned on last summer. Uh, it's not, it had, they had some technical difficulties uh, in the last year or so with the wires that hang their test masses. And so it took a while to get them turned on. They finally, they turned on and made it work at about the time we were ready to turn off for 15 months and negotiating with each other, we ran for an extra month. And I must say, some of us resented it. It was just being uh, nice to our neighbors, and, and we didn't expect much. Uh, we had been running for more than a year. Uh, we turned on and uh, uh, immediately saw, uh, not immediately, a couple of weeks later, we saw this event. You can see these, these pictures on the left are the so-called uh, time frequency plot. It gets a higher frequency as the signal gets narrower and gets brighter. So these are the two LIGO detectors on the left. And the Virgo detector, you can tell because it's not as bright, isn't as sensitive as LIGO at this point in time. But it's sensitive enough to give us this pointing information that uh, we need. So that together gave us this position in the sky, which was very uh, much better. And, and we even looked at that data to see polarization effects of the first attempt and so forth. In a sense, it was a measure that we actually had a third detector running, we could do better pointing, and we're ready, and it pretended well for the future. By some miracle, uh, a few days later, uh, let me, let me, uh, let me, no, I'll come back to this. A few days later, we saw this. And uh, this is, again, a time frequency plot where you can see barely but this little thing going to higher frequency. Frequencies up the, the left. Uh, in the two LIGO detectors, you can't see a signal uh, in the Virgo detector. But the position in the sky was favorable, such that even a small signal or no signal in the Virgo detector helped us tell the position in the sky quite accurately. We could, from this data, just from the amplitude of the signal, tell that this object was quite close. It was only about 40 megaparsecs away from us. And uh, not knowing the spins, there was some uncertainty, but basically we basically could tell uh, that much. And that information alone has been used to do an independent measurement of the Hubble constant, which we're able to do with gravitational waves independent of um, the astrophysics measurements, which I don't have time to really go into, but we'll give, but it's in controversy now in astrophysics, and hopefully we can help resolve that. The, the great thing that happened here was that we saw the merger in LIGO, Virgo, and 1.7 seconds later, uh, a detector it's been a satellite for some time, the Fermi satellite, which has been studying gamma ray bursts, saw a gamma ray burst signal in the same part of the sky. And that's shown here on the right with the Fermi signal as the big circle. The, the, I show both how well LIGO itself would do, the big bananas, and how much better we did with Virgo added to it. Uh, I take personal pride in this particular picture because I've basically been putting up with astronomers telling me for 10 years that we'll never be able to locate position in the sky well enough to do astronomy, and we did better than they did on this. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, once that happened, that opened the door to doing 
observations with anyone who has an astronomical instrument in different wavelengths, frequencies, and so forth. And uh, that uh, I'll show you in a minute. This is the Hubble constant measurement, which I have the slide out of order. Uh, we can tell the Hubble constant by just the distance away and the uh, signal we have, the, the velocity, which is the velocity the universe is expanding. Our measurement based on one event isn't great. Actually, people have recently done a reanalysis with some other information that's better. But what you can see is where we are and how gravitational waves maybe will start to play an important role. The two bands, the two vertical bands for the Hubble constant are two different ways the Hubble constant is measured by astronomers. And much of the debate, if you go to an astronomical meeting, is which one's right. And uh, this has been a debate for some time. Our measurement is this broader peak, but it's based on a single observation. And it's totally independent of what they've done and consistent. So we get 70 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, and uh, it, once we can have tens of events, our error will be similar to theirs and totally independent. So if they don't resolve the controversy themselves, I think we can look forward to uh, us helping to resolve the controversy with a really independent way. It's a complicated measurement which I can't go into in astrophysics, a ladder scheme that uh, is hard to do. Our method is completely independent of that. So this is an example, to, in my mind, of how it'll add to the, what's done. Anyway, impressively, an incredible number of astronomical instruments in everything from uh, gamma rays, X-rays, ultraviolet, optical, radio, blah, 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 were done, have pointed at this apparatus, followed it for weeks and months now, and uh, measured the effects. And those effects basically give us a good picture of the nuclear physics, of the physics of the merger of two neutron stars. And so it's done quite well. There's been various phenomenologies around. The phenomenology that seems to be at least qualitatively, so uh, much like what was observed in the single event, although the single event being maybe a special one, we don't know until you see more events, fits uh, a model by several uh, theorists called a Kelanova model of a neutron star uh, in spite of. Um, people like the fact that uh, this observation has a kind of popular appeal that we've detected the merger of two neutron stars and maybe it has helped us to solve one of the big problems in nature that we've had for a long time. And that is that uh, we've never been, a, physicists have, uh, or no one has been able to really explain where the heavy elements come from in the earth. So the earth was formed at some point, we have gold mines, platinum, all the things we love, we go down and mine them, sell them when they're on our fingers, but where did they come from? Uh, most of the universe is made out of hydrogen and helium. Uh, uh, we have stars that collapse. When they collapse, they basically have the fusion process going on. The fusion process, before they collapse, in burning, makes heavier elements, up to maybe iron. The collapse itself has been the place where people have looked to say something about the collapse itself must enhance the possibility of making yet heavier elements, but there's never been a satisfactory theory that was consistent with nuclear physics. Uh, in the laboratory, we make all these heavy elements pretty easily. What we do is bombard neutrons on heavy elements, and then we make a heavier one. And somebody names it, and it gets in the periodic table. Now we've got a source of neutrons. So colliding of two neutron stars is an ideal way to, at least phenomenologically, make uh, heavy elements. So based on one event, which is always dangerous, and trying to extrapolate how many neutron star mergers there might have been from that and what their nature might have been, uh, this is one phenomenological analysis, so with all those caveats, where the yellow parts or gold parts are the amount of the heavy elements that were made by neutron star collisions in the past by this uh, analysis. And 
your favorite elements, your favorite heavy elements like gold and platinum were pre presumably primarily made by collisions like we've just observed sometime in the past. Let me spend just a couple more minutes uh, talking about the future beyond what I did at the very beginning. So we've seen coalescing binary systems. As I said, we'll look for bursts. We are looking and hope to see burst signals, stochastic background signals, and continuous sources in the future. It requires improving the sensitivity and improving the pointing ability. In terms of pointing ability, we will have more than just LIGO and Virgo. We'll have the LIGO that we're going to build, that we're building in India and detector in Japan. So by, by uh, something like uh, 2025, we have, we'll have good Earth coverage and won't have to be lucky like we were in the event that we observed with Virgo last uh, August. We're working toward how to make better detectors. We'll keep improving LIGO, but how to make better detectors. The one being built in Japan is an illustration of that. First, we can get rid of more of the shaking of the earth if we go underground. So one possibility is going underground. The Japanese are doing that. They've built a detector, which isn't working yet, in the Kamioka mine. Secondly, uh, I alluded to this earlier, the Japanese, at least, are not the scheme that I think we'll use in the future, but they've cooled the, they're cooling the test masses. That's a hard problem. You have to get the heat out of the test masses, which are higher, hanging by basically nothing, a little thin wire, uh, without shaking them at all microscopically. So it's, an, it's a difficult problem, but they're trying to do that on their detector. So I call their detector a 2.5 generation detector, where advanced LIGO is second generation, LIGO is first generation. Uh, this is how well we'll be able to point in the sky. So this shows you where we can appoint, point well and poorly now. And by maybe 2025, we'll be able to point well anywhere in the sky. And this is how we'll, the sensitivities will evolve. We're basically at the top line now. And it'll come down to the black line over the next decade. So we're going to gain, we believe, with the technologies that we're instituting, somewhere like a factor of 5 to 10, just by improving LIGO and Virgo in the next decade. Just to give you a hint what that involves, it involves making larger test masses, maybe 100 kilograms, changing to maybe single crystal mirrors instead of few silica, silica in itself, lowering the temperature, probably not as low as the Japanese, improving the coating, I mentioned that we have a problem with coatings, and making a more powerful laser. All these are possible. Um, what will that do for us? It'll do the things that I just said, uh, but more Generally, it'll do a couple things. One is it'll enable us to look further out, which means earlier times, or become more cosmological. So we can study black holes and see how they evolve in time by going to uh, earlier times as we get some more cosmological reach. Right now we see nothing beyond C of 1. It'll, the improved signal and noise is the key. Not getting a thousand events of black hole, black hole, because each one is different, different masses, different orientations, but getting a signal to noise that's 10 times better on a single event, then we can tell the spins and precessions and all that kind of stuff. So it's different than particle physics where you keep adding statistics. What we want by the added sensitivity is see an event like the first event we had, but with 10 times the signal to noise. And the, rate, the event rate will increase at maybe a factor of 10 or so beyond advanced LIGO. So, uh, people are working then on what might happen on time scales. That's all on time scales of the next 10 years, on the time scale of maybe the next 20 years, uh, building a third generation detector. The most work by far that's been done toward that has been done in a study supported by the BEC, uh, which has gone on for about seven years, and it's what's called the Einstein Telescope. And it has basically the following features. It would be deep underground, increase, improving the seismic noise, have longer arms, 10 kilometers, be a triangle, which in itself can determine the polarization then rather than just a, an L shape, uh, be low temperature, cryogenic, and have optics that allow you to optimize low frequency or high frequency, depending on what you're trying to look for. Whether this is the right detector, 
and we don't know yet. We're starting to look at detectors also in the U.S. We have to worry about whether you make one fancy detector like this, one place in the Earth, or we want an array of high uh, sensitivity devices around the Earth. Uh, we're doing studies now to get our story together, so when we talk to the funding agencies, we know what we want. Uh, with that, let me say everything is an underground. So on the ground, we basically studied gravitational waves, phenomenon that happen on millisecond time scales. And I gave you a bunch of examples of that. In space, we look at a different frequency band. And there we can study phenomenon that happen on minutes to hour time scales. And that project is called LISA. It's supported by the European Space Agency and is supposed to fly in 2034. Uh, some optimists think they can move it forward, but usually space missions go the other way. Uh, this was a project that was originally both ESA and NASA. NASA pulled out when they had such large overruns on the James Webb Telescope, but is now in the process of probably rejoining, which means this will be done more like the, the scope, more like the original ESA, which we like. But this enables you to do science on the minute-to-hour time scale. We can also look on the year to decade time scale with gravitational waves, and people are trying to do this. The idea is to use uh, pulsar timing. Pulsars all give uniform timing. If you look at a whole set of pulsars at the same time in an array, and gravitational waves come through, it'll affect that timing, and you can read, uh, combine that. They're not able to do that yet, but optimists think that we'll be able to do that within the next decade. Lastly, is to understand things on billions of year time scale. The most uh, short term possibility there is to see the imprint of gravitational wave signals on the cosmic microwave background signal. That is the polarization signals that you can see. People thought they saw that in an experiment called BICEP2 a few years ago, uh, but there were noise effects that intervened and that hasn't stood out. But I believe that it's quite possible that we'll learn how to handle the noise problems well enough to see this kind of imprint from gravitational waves. What does that mean? The problem is that the photons were absorbed 400,000 years after the Big Bang. You can't go earlier than that. The only thing is to enhance the signal you see then with something that did generate itself at earlier times, like gravitational waves. So if you see an imprint of polarization, Due to gravitational waves, it gives us some information about what happened at earlier times. The ultimate experiment, and I'll end with that, uh, is to actually directly see gravitational waves from the first instance of the Big Bang. <clears throat> that isn't going to happen soon, but I think in the long term can happen. It's the, the right and only way to get back to the very first instance of the Big Bang. We said anything to do with photons is absorbed 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Uh, neutrinos could go much earlier, but neutrinos have thermalized since that time, and they're so low energy that they have very little cross-section, they're almost impossible to measure. So the real source is something that doesn't get absorbed, that we're learning how to measure, and that's gravitational waves. The stochastic background, the equivalent of the microwave background from, from uh, gravitational waves. To do that, we have to understand all the local sources first. We have to get in the right frequency band, and it'll depend, by right frequency band, it depends on issues like inflation, how much is that high frequency versus low frequency. Uh, but I think in the long term, and I mean long term, probably 100 years, um, understanding and measuring the, the evolution since the Big Bang, the very early stages of the universe with gravitational waves will uh, one day be possible. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for this fascinating first hand account. Um, we have time for a few questions. Yeah, we'll start here. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and for this interesting. Um, now, you are trying to, to, to increase sensibility of detectors, and, and you could speak of a network of detectors over, over the globe. But 
the, the blueprint of this pattern is basically, basically the same from the from the very beginning. All right, I, I'm, all things are understood. But what made you think back in 1994 when you took the picture? Did you show us before uh, building the, 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 the instrument that you were going to have to measure the signal at all about all those background noises? Uh, I'm not sure I understood it at all. Did, did we visualize all the background noise in 1994? No. When, before you start you build the instrument, what made you think that you were going to measure anything at all? Uh, well, I, I think I think the problem is similar to what you do with almost any new problem in experimental physics. You, you ask um, what the target goals are, where you think you can do the measurements you're going to do. In our case, it's are there sources strong enough to give signals that we could physically measure? What I used as a target is turned out to be the right target. 10 to the minus 21 was our target in 1994, but not based on black holes. We thought it would be the measurement that we just made, which is neutron stars. That we could predict with some uncertainty, because there are binary neutron star systems, a handful, seen in our own galaxy. And we could project then um, how long they take to merge. The ones that have been seen are not going to merge for a million years, so you have to see how many galaxies you have to see. The reason that's not a, a, um, a um, not as good a predictor as predicting the Higgs cross-section at CERN or something is that uh, we don't know how typical our galaxy is. We don't know really how, what fraction of the binary systems we've seen in our own galaxy. Those two uncertainties made the prediction rather difficult, but the, the most frequent one in covering it was roughly 10 to the minus 21. So we made a target that we, could we build a detector that could get to 10 to the minus 21. And from the beginning, we thought that we couldn't do it in one step. So we told the NSF in the beginning that we wanted to do two things. One is build an initial detector, which was already an enormous uh, extrapolation from what had been done before, and which in principle could detect gravitational waves. We couldn't say why. But it wasn't the predicted one, but we might detect them. And at the same time, begin a, an R&D program for uh, a uh, second version of LIGO. And that's what we went and sold to the NSF in 1994, early, and that's what they approved. So we were always on the same track that we were on. If you asked me in 1994 how long it would take to get to where we are today, I'm embarrassed to say I probably would have said 10 years, not 23. <laughs> um, would you say something about uh, the time standards that you used in the instruments? You didn't mention this, I believe. Uh, uh, are those major clocks enough, or is something else you need? Yeah, well, let's talk about the accuracy. We, we, we talk about uh, what limits us in pointing to the sky is the strength of our signals and measuring the amplitudes. We have uh, the time between them is 10 plus or minus 10 milliseconds, so we don't have to have super accuracy. We just have to tell somewhere to 10% or 5%. Uh, something like a millisecond accuracy, something like that, in the clocks in the different places. And that's not hard. Further questions? I want to, to know your opinion about the ring down phase. The ring down, regarding the ring down. The ring down phase. In particular, uh, regarding with the uh, merger of two neutron stars, yeah. this epoch is very important. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah. uh, thank, thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. How to yeah. prove the yeah. solution of this? Yeah. So, uh, to really understand neutron stars, uh, we haven't gotten very far. And understanding neutron stars when they merge together is probably the ideal, our best we have laboratory to do that. Um, the, uh, so what happens is just what I showed before. We'll see two objects come together. A little more complicated because they tear at each other, so they're not as simple as black holes. So we have uh, those kind of effects. So the, that part's a little different. But then they come together. Uh, we've seen that much. Later, 
there can be all kinds of nuclear physics effects and resonances and so forth that are seen, and people have modeled those in, in various ways. The models aren't very extensive at this point, but even worse, uh, they tend, the effects that you can measure tend to be quite high frequency. They're roughly a kilohertz or a couple kilohertz, not 100 hertz. You remember that our sensitivity curve goes up, and so making uh, good sensitivity at high frequency is a, is a difficult problem. We need a higher power laser and probably optics that emphasize. I mentioned that the European underground one has different uh, optics for high frequencies and low frequencies. So you can sacrifice the low frequencies to do the high frequencies. We're starting to have, it's healthy, but we're starting to have the kind of science arguments inside of LIGO. Do we press on the low frequencies to get lots of black holes and figure out what the origin is of those? Or do we work on the high frequencies? You can't do it all at the same time. But I, I think it's doable, but we have to probably improve a factor of 10 at high frequencies to see the kind of effects that are in the literature now. And, the, and that goal, the ultimate goal for people is to, under, to determine the equation of state of a neutron star. Okay, one or two last questions. If there's no one else, I'll ask mine. Um, right, there's, we, we have big projects doing, like, characterizing three interactions, uh, colliders, we can measure all these things very well. Uh, we have a hard time getting to connect quantum field theory with, with gravity. I remember Kip Thorne was asked during one of the announcements whether he thought LIGO would get us any closer to, to connecting the two worlds, and he said no. Uh, I've heard other people being more optimistic, but didn't quite work out how they thought that would happen. Do you have a vision on <coughs> what the relation between particle physics and, and this yeah. gravitational wave yeah. astronomy might be? I, I, I can't speak for Kip Thorne. Uh, his vision of how it would be done eventually so a little different than my idea, and because he's a theorist and I'm an experimentalist. Uh, he thinks it really will involve uh, studying the early universe. LIGO can't, as I said, that's not going to be done now. It's you know, maybe 100 years from now, I don't know, before we can see the signal directly from the early universe. And so his idea is that not just seeing, say, inflation, but seeing other effects in the early universe is the way we'll understand how to bring quantum physics and, and general relativity together. Uh, I haven't said it very well, but that's what we would say more romantically. Uh, I, I uh, have a different view being an experimentalist, and that is that uh, theorists have tried for decades to make a convergence between uh, general relativity and quantum field theory and failed. Um, um, maybe string theory has some hope, but it's hard to become physical when it works in 11 dimensions. So uh, I, I think you have to find a, uh, and so theorists have worked on it for 50 years. We need, what we need, I think, is some experimental clues that will guide us to what the way, the way to bring uh, uh, gravitational physics or general relativity and quantum physics together. And I think we have, in, I don't know how to do it, but I think we have a potential place to do that, which we're start just beginning to study in those black holes. Those black holes have the feature that they study general relativity in the strongest possible way. And we have to deal with all the quantum numbers and everything that has to do with uh, quantum physics. So if we can not just see that we have black holes and whether they're spinning, but what their features are and actually study black holes, I think it may be the potential laboratory to to get experimental clues. So my answer is a little different than Kim's. Thank you. Is there one other question? You can still have it. <laughs> Do you think we will ever be able to develop a, develop a technology that will detect all the movement in the universe by gravitational waves? How optimist are you? All the movement in the universe? Yeah, all the, like, from these rotations to the yeah. rotation of a planet. 
Yeah. Um, it, it's so far from what we can do now that I, I certainly don't project that we can do that kind of thing with gravitational waves. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's thank Rory again. Uh -huh.